Welcome everybody and I appreciate there'll be some people we're starting right at three o'clock. There's some people, additional people will be joining us, but welcome to the second of the International Society for Research on Solitude, the ISRS uh, seminar series. Uh, run jointly by uh, myself at Bishop Grosseteste University and the University of Szczecin. Uh, I am Julian Stern from Bishop Grosseteste. I'm president of the ISRS for my sins uh, and also for a different set of sins, uh, Malgosia uh, Vawako, who is vice president in charge of all the vices of uh, the organization, vice president of the ISRS and uh, Rafa Ivansky, who is the secretary of the ISRS. Uh, we're delighted to be able to put these seminars uh, together. Uh, there's a lot more um, that's going on this afternoon. Absolutely delighted. We will be introducing Richard Cleveland talking about children and silence, and I will introduce him more fully in a, in a minute. Just to mention the ISRS, there is a wonderful website uh, not only with information about the society, the conferences that we've held, the special editions of journals, uh, books and other materials, publications by members of the organisation. If you haven't looked at that, uh, please do search it out. Uh, the address is at the bottom of the screen and please do join us. Uh, this year, special offer, it is free to join us. Next year, we will double the fees uh, so they will still be free. Uh, and if you wish to write to us about the organisation, there is an email address especially for the organisation, though of course you can also write to us individually. We're all easily searchable. Uh, so that's the website and on the website we have the recording, the video recording of our previous seminar by Malka Margalit and the questions and discussion. Uh, and we will be putting onto the website a video of this uh, seminar as well. If we are currently recording the seminar, that should show up on your um, uh, uh, on your screens. Uh, if you don't wish to be recorded, uh, of course, keep your camera off. If you don't wish to be heard on the recording, then keep your microphone off. Uh, but if you uh, show yourself or talk, uh, we assume you give permission uh, for that. It is a uh, it is good to get you all together and from across across the world. Uh, but particularly we're here to listen to Richard Cleveland. Richard, I've known for 15 years, I think Richard, something like that, a long time, uh, and we worked together on various things. Uh, and I visited Richard's school. Richard is a, was a school counsellor, is now a head of a programme of school counselling. Uh, and when he was still in school, but researching on school counselling, I visited his school. So I know him uh, from his uh, school days, lovely school as well. Uh, Richard is a Associate Professor, Programme Director of Counselling Education at Georgia Southern University at the uh, uh, Statesboro, uh, sorry something's come up on my screen, at the Statesboro campus of Georgia Southern in Georgia, uh, the US. He has researched on mindfulness, school counselling, psychophysiological responses to traumatic incidents, and many other things. He's also published on student wellness in schools, contemplative practices uh, and mindfulness interventions with first responders, uh, which is also a practicing nationally board certified mental health clinician. Uh, most of all, he is a, a wonderful human being as well. Uh, that's official, uh, the ISRS uh, stamp of wonderfulness. He's going to be talking about uh, children and silence for about 40 minutes and uh, then we'll have a uh, chance to ask him questions and discuss issues and Richard is happy to take part in that uh, then. So over to you Richard, I will stop sharing my screen and if you wish to share your screen, if you are doing uh, a uh, PowerPoint or whatever you're doing Richard, uh, now is the time. And is that is that fine? Can you see that? Julian? Uh, yes, I can see that. Yes, I'll switch my camera off in a minute once I know that it's all working. All righty. Um, thank you very much for that um, very generous introduction. Um, I will make sure to put the check in the mail so that you can receive it for said wonderful introduction. Uh, before this started, um, I was mentioning to to Barbara, to Gosha and to Julian that 
Um, it is very exciting. It is very humbling and an honor to be here and presenting. Um, and the question was asked if I was nervous and I shared, um, of, of course I am nervous because this um, this isn't um, a presentation to straight. It does not feel like a presentation to strangers. Um, this is a presentation that's really feeling more like a discussion. And so that's exciting for me, but it also means like a truly uh, meaningful discussion. Uh, even though I may be starting the discussion, it will not only end with me and I may even be challenged in uh, the questions and what we talk about. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for um, the ISRS inviting me to speak. Um, here is what I hope to cover in this time um, to, as Julian mentioned, to talk about um, some of the perceptions or perhaps better, um, better stated the expectations of silence with children, determining healthy silence, um, and then, as he mentioned, most of my research has focused on mindfulness, whether it's in school or with the military or law enforcement. Um, and so towards that end, um, I just want to finish by talking about um, an unfortunate um, change, but hopefully a meaningful change. And what I mean by that is now my work has shifted, taking a lot of my trauma informed practices and taking that from military law enforcement populations and providing that for educators to work with their students um, as they are navigating trauma. And then, of course, as mentioned, uh, in ending this time with a discussion. And so to start off um, in learning in for myself, learning about silence um, with children, I thought I might start this by just framing it um, literally picture framing, starting with pictures and um, as I, as I tend to like to put some images every now and then in my PowerPoint so that you are not staring at uh, blocks of text the whole time. It was interesting to me that by just entering the search identifiers silence and child, as you may see at the top of the screen here in uh, the search engine Bing, uh, I would argue that the majority of these have some sort of negative uh, connotation or meaning um, from that. And that uh, very often silence is associated in a negative or considered perhaps in a negative connotation. Um, I, I offer this. This is um, I, I live in Georgia, the state of Georgia in rural um, areas. And so this is um, my son um, in the background fishing in this one of the swamps um, around where we live. And um, it, it's interesting to me that one of his favorite activities is to go out into the swamp, the, the wilderness behind our, our home, and just to be out there by himself uh, fishing um, just in the quiet of the wood. Um, and he takes this as a time of joy. Um, I do not submit this as evidence of wonderful parenting. Um, instead, that uh, perhaps confirmation that indeed um, as, as I hope to show, silence can be a healthy and, and indeed a, a necessary component for well-being and healthy development. Two quotes uh, to shift from visual representations. Two quotes I find interesting. The first one is much of my uh, work clinically um, with clients. Um, I will be rec uh, using the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for coming up with diagnoses, for determining diagnoses for clients. And so I just have here the criteria for selective mutism as it presents in child in children where the child shows consistent failure to speak in specific social situations where there is that expectation um, despite speaking in other situations. And I hope to show later on that it's that word expectation. And I would also put with that autonomy or agency that is going to prove so key for healthy silence. And then the other one um, I know very often here in um, the United States culture society is uh, the John Merck saying children should be seen and not heard. Again, having uh, this expectation. And so uh, really, as I started looking into this for myself and learning and reading, uh, I, I was struck by the, the interesting juxtapositioning again, the, the differences, the comparisons where being silent um, and refraining from speech could be um, easily considered good and easily considered bad. And some examples I show here is clearly uh, while the teacher is uh, instructing, while the teacher is speaking, uh, for the child to remain silent uh, would carry the, the weight or carry the value of being a good behavior. Uh, and yet that same behavior, if you will, when the teacher then asks for an answer, prompts for a response from the class, that same choice to be silent, that same action may now carry the value of being bad, being inappropriate. 
Um, similarly, uh, when the child is with their peers in the library, um, there's the expectation that uh, one is to be quiet, one is to be silent in the library. Um, and, and yet that same silence perhaps in the gymnasium um, during physical activities out at the Risa on play, at playground time could be considered bad, maladaptive. Teachers may become concerned. Um, and, and then the last one I have here really strikes me um, in terms of how adults, how educators, how school counselors, school psychologists interact with children in that school environment. And, and that oftentimes uh, I, may, I may be tempted to um, end my sentences perhaps with a common phrase or an idiom. Um, here with the teenagers in my household, um, the idiom always seems to be, you know. So, um, well, I went out with my friends, you know, and then we had a great time, you know. Um, other similar phrases might be right or you understand or you, you get it. And oftentimes these are uttered in regular conversation with no expectation for a response. And so uh, noticing how this carries over into the classroom setting where an adult, an instructing adult, the educator may constantly have this and on paper, looking at the text of the conversation, you would expect there to be a response as technically a question has been asked and yet by the intention of the speaker, remaining silent is good. Uh, and then contrasting that, um, there has been um, uh, books at the time when I was practicing as a school counselor, as Julian mentioned, uh, Real Boys, Boy Code, talking about some of the um, social situations for children, specifically boys, specifically bullying um, and their perceptions socially. And so one of the things that always stuck with me is rather than asking them if they are OK uh, in the middle of a bullying incident, in the middle of a fight, in the middle of an altercation, Oftentimes there will be values, peer pressures, peer values influencing whether they remain silent or not. And so I may, as the caring adult, ask them, are you OK? Um, he was pushing you. He was bullying you. Are you OK? And if the child does not respond and remains silent, my initial um, response may be up. Oh, that's bad. That's not they're unhealthy. Something's wrong. Whereas for that child, they may be choosing to remain silent because they're cons they're concerned about losing status among their peers. They're concerned about pr uh, presenting themselves as a weak individual. So I, I just suggest these as just some some different contrasts where in the school se setting in the in the classroom setting, uh, the same action perhaps or how the child goes about being quiet, engaging silence can be construed as either good or bad. And so learning about silence, what constitutes silence? Um, I, I was struck by um, a band I, I enjoy listening to um, and he, the artist sings a song about how difficult, how painful it was to drive his car once his radio was broken and that suddenly he had no choice. Every time he drives his car, he is confronted by silence where normally he has this routine of always filling the void, always filling the silence with noise and um, he talks about the silence being violent. And so I, I think about that and as I learned about silence, as I continue to learn about silence, um, these are some of the, um, the some of the points that I found in the literature that have guided me. And, and first is this idea as I was sharing that picture of, of our son fishing that silence can be a healthy component of development, can be necessary for well-being. And that it can be difficult um, at the same time to achieve in our modern society, our modern culture of noise, not just in terms of exterior noise, be it cars, be it loud music, but also the stimuli noise of smartphones, tablets, screens, always um, interacting with children. And I and I believe um, I believe there's a part of this that either Malka referenced in her seminar or came about in the discussion. I, I was struck again, a second point here, that silence has been investigated as a therapeutic component that uh, put within a wilderness experience, a wilderness excursion. Um, they synthesized in this study, they synthesized silence and solitude as a therapeutic tool for the clients, for the patients. Um, and, and, and if I may just briefly, that is exciting for me and it gives me hope that, okay, yes, silence can be healthy and can be healing. A part of me is sad that that it is it was considered and is being considered and written up as such a um, 
novel, innovative therapy that, oh my goodness, you actually went to, into the woods. So I, I, again, I, I'm encouraged and yet saddened by that. Uh, and then, of course, silence within psychotherapy. And this is something in my classes, uh, working with my students, teaching them, whether uh, I'm teaching a class on individual one-on-one -on -one counseling or small group counseling, we talk about silences within the interactions between therapist and client. Those silences can be perceived as obstructive, um, causing um, uh, disruption or causing uh, uncomfortableness for the client, but they can also be productive. And so oftentimes they just may be neutral. Uh, it is just really clear uh, as the quote here, Zimmerman and, and colleagues wrote that that silence conveys information. It, it is not just merely an absence. It, there is meaning to it. It's incumbent on me as the therapist, as the clinician to then uh, attentively listen, take in the verbals and nonverbals of my client to decide is that neutral, productive, or obstructive um, in terms of that meaning. Uh, one of the quotes from Elson is, silence is a fertile mode in which the self is enriched and strengthened, the source of that quiet growth in which distortions of the self can be reflected upon and then transformed. Uh, I, I also uh, I, I appreciated this point that silences can be considered a crucial element towards that religious formation. And, and actually in, in this uh, article from Howard, uh, they specifically talk about that this lack of downtime, of quiet time for children. I, again, I would contend this lack because of the increase of noise, of um, modern society, of very busy schedules this lack of downtime and quiet time for children is detrimental to their healthy development. Um, yes, psychosocial, yes, uh, mental, emotional, but as Howard points out, even religious faith uh, reflective. Uh, and then the last one here that I found fascinating was a study looking at different genres of music and how the different genres, be they um, rock, country, blues, Apologies, Julian, I don't know that they included operatic, uh, but I believe there was classical and, and these different genres and looking at when the uh, participants in this study had their own choice to determine which music to listen to, which genres of music helped to increase their relaxation and decrease their anxiety. And what was so fascinating to me is with this study, Silence was not considered a control. Silence was not considered a void or an absence of the music. Silence was in and of itself considered a genre. And the findings were that the music, whatever genre, none of the music genres options were any more relaxing. None of them were statistically significant as being more relaxing than silence. Uh, and, and they mentioned outright that previous studies had always viewed silence as just merely a statistical control rather than one of the available interventions. And so um, among, I believe I'll show the reference later on, and of course uh, I will have those available at the end. Oh yes, down here at Vail. Um, there are multiple models, paradigms for considering silence, um, be it um, an eight to 10 point continuum. Uh, what I have, outlined here and sort of coming to some sort of synthesis for myself in learning and moving forward is looking at three primary conceptualizations of, of silence. And the first one is autonomous silence and, and recognizing silence as an entity so that it, this is distinct from my individual will, uh, from my individual will or agency. This is me encountering silence. And, and as I have here, I think of the stillness of the night um, again, the quiet of a wood, um, maybe the, the coming of a storm, a, a large thunderstorm. And, and so nothing is audible. Yes, there's an absence. However, once again, as I mentioned earlier in terms of therapy, there is something conveyed. There is um, meaning communicated. So autonomous silence that it is in and of itself in existence. The second one is perhaps um, what many people, and I would argue what ma the majority of the literature when you do a search, uh, what it references, and that's imposed silence. So the, the images I started with, where silence is exerted upon another. 
Um, it seems that when I was reviewing and, and um, looking at Oxford down below, nearly nearly every verb form of silence refers to imposed silence. Um, I'm, I will put them silent. Um, they were silenced. I will silence this argument. I will reduce them to silence. And so this is where I, I am given no choice that my silence is not because of my own decision. It is forced upon me. And so the last one, um, and spoiler alert that I, I'm asserting is if it, perhaps not the only healthy form of silence, but um, is the most healthy is chosen silence. And, and here, this is experienced through my decision, through my intentional will, similar to employed behavior. Um, and again, this is, I have here perhaps the creation of something rather than the lack of something when we consider how to look at silence and the the definition I, I, I think that most aligns with this is uh, the fact of abstaining or forbearing from speech or utterance that again um, I am choosing to not uh, have speech to not make noise and, and so in moving forward from there I, I it seems to me that within these three forms the, the this idea of agency or autonomy is clearly at play because if I am being silenced, if it is imposed silence that I'm experiencing, then I have no agency. There's no autonomy for me. If I am uh, engaging in chosen silence, then I have the ability, the space that I am able to exert my intention. And so looking at agency and autonomy, just to make sure I was on the right track, uh, looking and looking at some of the definitions and that ability and that choice to decide actions and see the results, um, being the originator of the action, a causal agent. And, and in terms of autonomy, that I'm able to do things for myself, I'm able to express my will to behave independently. Um, and, and this was interesting to me, the Erford, I'm a, I have the ability to make well-informed de decisions and, and that I can recognize that I have control and I am exerting control. When I was uh, first starting this, uh, this journey to learn more about it, it came at a time where I was actually also teaching one of my courses in developmental theory. So preparing my, my students, whether they were going to become school counselors or clinical mental health counselors, um, teaching them the lifespan development course. So, of course, looking at, um, as, as I have here, Piaget, Vygotsky, Erickson, Bandura, many of these theorists, and oftentimes, um, it's been my observation, that oftentimes professionals here in the States, and definitely my students, uh, like to lean towards stage theorists. Um, perhaps it's a little easier to have a certain number of stages, it's a linear conceptualization, whatever whatever it may be, um, it, it's very easy to tend towards those theorists. And so um, when we were talking, when I was talking about agency, I happened to be teaching the class at that time, and I, I started looking at some of the ways that agency might be conceptualized, um, at least for me on, on, a, uh, on a starting level, within some of these different theorists for Piaget, um, this idea of the self getting to the stage in my development where I recognize um, that I am distinct as the self in the same way that um, his object permanence like hiding the toy for example that that object is distinct and remains in existence even when I don't see it uh, really extending that to the self as well that, that I am distinct um, from other be it toy be it mother be it father um, I, I for me, I think definitely with Vygotsky, looking at the role of the individual and the social, I, I think a valid um, discussion would be um, looking at where uh, emphasis is placed and the influences of the social versus the individual. Of course, I would assert that that still requires that I am able to distinguish myself from the social. Uh, looking at Erickson's stages of looking at autonomy, the pursuit of autonomy, the pursuit of initiative, and then also with Bandura that these qualities have direct relation to feelings, their emotions and cognitions so that we have motivation, self-efficacy, influencing behavior. Okay, so that brought me to where I was in looking at um, stage theory to help me <laughs> just as much as my students conceptualize autonomy and agency in children, with children. One of the things my concern was I noticed for myself and my students, it can be very easy to fall into a dichotomous paradigm with these stage theories. And 
my observation has been it can be very easy to look at that definition and very okay yes you are fine or yes you are not fine and, and really have very dichotomous very different perceptions of autonomy and agency and one of the analogies um, that i've used many times with my students as well as in some presentations is growing up in the mountains and the mountain roads having these um, stone barriers we call them guardrails that help you navigate the the windy road and and I, and i would use that imagery and say that okay yes these stage theories provide the guiding barriers the obstacles the guardrails that tell me where the boundaries are and where the limits are however to only ride on one side or the other doesn't do, doesn't help my car and doesn't help my journey and, and so challenging myself and challenging my students to to think in the same way that that road provides a, a continual a spectrum perhaps i can use this imagery when i'm considering autonomy and agency in the development of children perhaps i can say yes it is clear that this is fantastic and healthy and it is clear that this is unhealthy maladaptive um however where is that child where is my client along that continuum and, and how do i engage with discussing their development and their well-being um, in describing it in approaching it and addressing it without defaulting to those extremes um going from this of course for me having so much of my research uh, regarding mindfulness this immediately caught my attention uh, because for me to know where i am along that spectrum for myself and my development or again working with my students working with children working with my clients i need awareness i i cannot distinguish where i am in that continuum where i am on that road if you will unless i have awareness this awareness of myself awareness of others awareness of those actions and behavior be engaged and the results so clearly for me it became this um this pre um preemptive point that i must have awareness to get to that point of, of agency and, and knowing where i am i also must have that awareness so that i can have that agency to then have healthy silence to then move towards chosen silence and, and so mindfulness and um, if you'll uh, permit me for a, for a moment I, I i believe again malka i think this was either in her presentation or perhaps in a discussion it was mentioned about mindfulness as a practice and so this is something that I, I have done in my clinical application, working with clients um, across all age ranges, children, adolescents, and adults. It's something I've worked as, as Julie mentioned in my research with military and law enforcement, and definitely in the school setting, working with children. And so just as a, a point of common ground, dispelling some of the myths, myths, pardon me, that mindfulness is not just meditation only. That yes, very frequently one of the, um, best in terms of if you'll forgive me most efficient one of the most um, engaging ways to uh, practice mindfulness is through meditation however there are also different modalities different interventions to experience to cultivate and to practice mindfulness um, there's a perception at least in the united states that it's a buddhist thing uh, that oh it's it's out of the buddhist tradition and so it's only for buddhism and, and to be quite frank um, i've noticed in some of the communities for example here in the southern united states where there is a very strong judeo-christian um, presence history culture there has been um, resistance against mindfulness because of this um, and for a separate day a separate discussion um, i i completely disagree with that and, and i believe there are countless in, uh, examples in, in other faith traditions of similar contemplative practices that lead towards that cultivate mindfulness um, there's this misperception that mindfulness cures people. All I have to do is um, engage in a mindfulness meditation with Richard and whoo, I'll be wonderful. And, and that's not true. Uh, it is not a panacea. Um, it is a means towards wellness, towards healing, towards awareness. Yes, but it's not a magical cure. And then the last one, John Kabat-Zinn is, is a recognized um, foundational member of in terms of mindfulness practices, research literature. Uh, and he has dubbed the term Mick Mindfulness. Uh, really giving a wink and a nod to McDonald's and this idea that um, we can mass produce, make it cheaper, make it faster, make it quicker. And, and, and he has sounded the warning bell that with the exciting 
growth in terms of mindfulness research, mindfulness practices, there have unfortunately be, uh, grown dubious practices and agents who are creating mindfulness workshops, apps, resources just for the purpose of creating, uh, of g gaining money, wealth, fame, whatever it may be, and not focused on the sincerity or truly what uh, mindfulness is about. So what is it about? Kabat-Zinn talks about mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way. Um, mindfulness is purposeful, non-judgmental, present moment awareness involving novelty production. And so briefly to talk about that, mindful of our time here, purposeful, this is the idea that in practicing mindfulness, I'm doing this on purpose. I am dedicating a time, a place, and energies towards this. This is, this is not one more thing for me to do while multitasking, that this is intentional, it's on purpose. It's present moment, so this is not um, perseverating on the past, nor is it anxiously worrying about the future. It is making the intentional choice to focus on the present moment. And yes, as I'm doing that and focusing on centering myself, I'm focusing on my breath, my thoughts, my emotions, of course, there may come um, regrets, there may come memories of the past, there may come worries or concerns about the future. Oh, that's right, I need to go to the grocery store and pick up this item. And so, yes, I will welcome those, I will attend to those, but I will not focus um, unduly or perseverate or let those capture my attention. Instead, I redirect back to the present moment. Non-judgmental, this, this is not saying that is, it is devoid of morals or beliefs. This is referring to the autopilot judgments that we so often fall into. That, oh, I shouldn't. I, 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 that was wrong of me. I never should do that. Oh, this always happens. Um, these automatic knee-jerk responses that are very common, especially when we experience more stress, when we experience trauma, um, resisting those autopilot immediate judgments. Instead, attending again to that thought, perhaps that what I mentioned, a regret. Uh, thought of the past comes and I have a feeling of regret. Noticing that and attending it, not ignoring it, but not immediately saying, yep, that was a regret. regret. I did it wrong. I made a bad choice. I'm a terrible person. And so this leads to awareness overall and it, and it helps me um, calm, it helps me focus on, by starting on the body and focusing on the sensations, oftentimes breathing for a guiding breath. The more I practice that, I can open that awareness, I can combat, if you will, those autopilot judgments, and I can open up my awareness now to my emotions, to my thoughts, cognition, all of those things, and hopefully then approach it in a more aware manner. Now, this last part, novelty production, this just means that when I am engaging in that purposeful, present moment, non-judgmental awareness, then hopefully coming out of that is this idea that new perspectives, new innovative thoughts or ways of looking at things, new possibilities are now available for me to, to think about, to, um, to approach. And this is mostly Ellen Langer has written on this in terms of mindful learning. And so while these first four, purposeful, present moment, non-judgmental awareness, these are four components that, that you will find across all mindfulness literature. You'll notice that novelty production, creativity, innovation, this, this idea um, here it, of malleable perspectives, this is mostly coming out of more Western tradition, more Western explorations of mindfulness. And so with mindfulness, um, one of the therapies that I um, frequently will use with clients is looking at dialectical behavior therapy. And so with, without um, inundating everyone, this idea that reality is composed, is comprised of these dynamic, these opposing forces, the thesis, antithesis forces. And our wellness is found not in choosing one of those opposing forces, and living by that, but instead um, identifying that these are opposing forces, that I'm somewhere in the middle, and then resolving that tension by finding synthesis. And, and so for me, um, again, this just came all together at a wonderful time that I thought this reminds me of that discussion of agency and autonomy. This reminds me of those guardrails, if you will, on that road that this is one more way in working with my clients, one more way perhaps in framing my interventions in the classroom, my interventions 
in the clinic where I can recognize that, yes, there are dichotomies, there are extremes going on here. And not only is that okay, I can find synthesis. I can find wellness by working through these dialectics. And some of the ones that are often given as examples is healing requires that I accept myself, but it always re also requires that I change. Um, oftentimes I'm doing the best I can, and yet I may have a situation where I have to try harder. Um, I may not have created all of the challenges that I'm facing, and, and yet I will need to show some responsibility in, in order to solve them. Uh, I need to learn about my past without perseverating on it or obsessing about it, which can lead to depression. In the same way, yes, I, I, it should, I should be planning for my future, but not to the point of anxiety. And within DBT, within dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness is a tool that is frequently used to cultivate awareness, to cultivate acceptance. And that way, I can, as I mentioned earlier, I can find out, I can become aware of not only those opposing forces, but I can then find my place within there and have that awareness cultivated to help me accept where I am in the present moment. Again, that, uh, that idea of present moment. But as they mentioned here, for that synthesis, not that I, am, I have found myself in the present moment and here I stand. But, but then, no, I can proceed with that synthesis. I can find out where I want to go towards wellness. So uh, oftentimes in my class session, I, I call this the um, the so what Richard uh, slide for my students. So like, OK, so what? What does that mean for me? And so where I am at um, in learning more and writing about silent silence is I have just been struck how um, mindfulness and DBT, I believe, can be tools to help me as a clinician, to help me as an educator. Um, create those spaces, create those um, opportunities for healthy silence. Why? Because again, my previous argument was that healthy silence, yes, it can be that autonomous silence where I just happen to go on a walk in a quiet wood and I'm, I'm able to recognize the, the stillness, the silence and the meaning to it requires awareness. But even more so, that chosen silence that I am exerting my autonomy, my agency to experience silence. In order to exert that agency, that autonomy, I, I need to have it, which again, I need awareness of myself as distinct. I need awareness of my choices. So for me, it, it backs all of it, stacks together that by pursuing awareness, by facilitating awareness for my clients, for my students, I can hopefully use this as a framework. It, forgive a clunky term, but it's a framework to pursue um, healthy silence for them. And so as I have on here, um, through mindfulness, that is purposeful. Again, that modeling for my students and, and showing them and leading them that you can initiate this. It requires dedicated time, space, and energies um, to practice mindfulness, to experience and practice silence. That it is non-judgmental. Again, non-judgmental. I don't mean throwing out uh, morals, throwing out values, but that um, looking at different perspectives. That yes, it is true that there are times where, as your teacher, um, I am asking you to be quiet. I am, in 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 all honesty, imposing silence. And this is another time where this is silence, and it isn't that perspective. It doesn't have that meaning to it present moment, that, that it is attending to the silence at the present moment uh, and their awareness of it. What does it, again, mindfulness starting with the physical sensations and then from there working to the mental and the emotional. And, and so in that same way, starting with um, the very basic behavioral, what, is it, what does it feel like to be in silence? What, what does it sound like? What do you hear? What do you, what do you smell? What do you see? And from there then moving, and, and what are the thoughts? What are the feelings, what are the emotions you have in this silence? And, and then as mentioned with, with DBT, my, my hope is that, um, of, of course, neither of these are the corner on the market, are the only way to pursue healthy silence. I think they provide a framework and those stepping stones. And so DBT navigating, again, those opposing perceptions, those opposing forces, um, whether it's directive versus autonomous, 
yes, again, those for both forms of um, of silence may be present in that school setting, in that clinical setting, and, and knowing that you can exert agency uh, during times and spaces in that middle ground to synthesize your healthy silence. Whether you are isolated versus versus alone, two very dichotomous extremes, um, I think, of solitude, but also in terms of that uh, being alone in your awareness and your silence, even when we're practicing it together in the classroom and we're all silent. And then, as I mentioned, silenced versus silent. Um, that knowing, okay, yes, these are extremes, and there are times where I will be up against one extreme or the other. Where are the spaces in between? How, how do I become aware of those spaces and how do I navigate those? As I mentioned, um, I started in the school setting. Um, I have had many careers. I have a grandfather who was fond of saying the longest road is the sweetest. Um, perhaps there's a correlation to how often he was lost when he was driving, but that's that's something else. Uh, and, and so, as I mentioned, um, I have done research writing and clinical work in terms of trauma. And so uh, just briefly, um, there's been uh, many opportunities for me as of late to provide trainings, workshops, and services for teachers, for school counselors on how to address trauma with students, trauma in that school setting. And one of the things that I often talk about is I talk about trauma as being the leaky roof or a flash flood. And, and just that trauma can be, um, if we take the example of a house and water damaging the house, a leaky roof over years and years can erode away the walls of the house and cause it to, to crumble. And so trauma can be like that. It can be a constant drain, a constant drip upon the individual. Trauma can also be that flash flood that it's not over years, but in that instant washes away the house completely. And so we can talk about uh, acute trauma, chronic trauma, all these different terms for it, that it's it's the potential threat to one's well-being and safety. And that the second point most specifically for education that there can be trauma experienced directly, acute trauma. There can also be this secondary or vicarious trauma that as educators working with students experiencing acute trauma, direct trauma, I then am splash, experiencing um, the term splash over. I mean, I'm experiencing some of this trauma myself, even though I wasn't directly involved. Uh, I also think about students that even though they may not be directly experiencing trauma related to um, abuse, to natural disaster, to COVID-19, how much vicarious, how much secondary trauma are they experiencing through what they're hearing, through um, what they're seeing? And, and as mentioned, my work has focused on the neurophysiological responses to stress. And when we are in trauma, we are stressed. And so when we look at the common components, not just in the school setting, in the school setting, yes, but even beyond, the common components for trauma-informed practices focus on safety, focus on trust, creating these qualities, these characteristics within the classroom setting or clinical setting in order to help the individual experiencing trauma. Um, predictability and consistency, an intentional relationship, and awareness so that they are able to mitigate that hyper arousal to stress. And so, you know, um, once again, maybe not surprising at this point in our, in our time together, I believe there is a direct correlation with mindfulness and DBT practices. And I, again, we can, during discussion, correct me, I believe Malka referenced this in her seminar that um, COVID-19 has brought many traumas and many ex uh, maladaptive experiences, um, and it has amplified um, at-risk factors, traumas, experiences already present. And I know definitely observe from my work with students who are in the field right now, who are practicing as school counselors and clinicians, factors such as chronic absenteeism, lack of motivation, socioeconomic hardship, self-harm, suicidal intent, all of these very real challenges and obstacles that were concerns for trauma before COVID-19, they are still present and really in essence magnified, amplified because of COVID-19. And so whereas all of these um, concerns uh, may have Maybe we'll do a book study or we'll talk about trauma in the school setting. 
all of these are resulting in many schools around here really wanting right now, what are practices I can do right now? And so I, I think of mindfulness and DBT as practices of not only helping to address trauma as I've already been doing with schools, but also as, in, in dealing with trauma and providing a means for healthy silence. And so towards that, I'll finish with these last two slides here that some of the resources um, are, there's so many resources out there, and these are some that you'll be able to, of course, check on the video, and then the PowerPoint will be available, and some of the practices. My, my only um, parting shot would, of course, be, as John Kabat-Zinn uh, really urges, avoid mic mindfulness, that knowing, as we would with any new text, any new intervention, it truly is uh, pointing to health and wellness for my clients rather than a, um, a, a quick purchase. And with that, I, I hope to have at least started a conversation, Julian, and, and I will uh, pass this back to you. I must remember to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Richard. That's wonderful. Um, yes, it is part of a, a yeah, good conversation. Uh, I have uh, people have the facility, actually, and uh, Torgia, I think, has uh, put his electronic hand up, which is wonderful uh, because that's a good way to indicate that you'd like to ask a question. Uh, we haven't got the chat facility within this system, but uh, you can put your hand up. So Torgia, would you like to start us off if you I can't see you, but I can. Uh, but I think your microphone is on. Do you have a question or a comment? Can, can you hear? Yes, just. I can hear. OK, so but that, that's fine. You, 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 you don't have to be bothered with this, uh, with, the, with any visuals, and you can just concentrate on what you're hearing. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, talk Richard. I think there's many interesting thoughts here, and you've been sort of reading uh, a, a, a large ground, you know, preparing a large ground. But what I would like to ask you is about sort of the larger picture here because um, you bring up this question of acceptance and I think this is it's interesting but I think we should also place it in the proper context because the question is whether we should always accept uh, where we are or rather who we are called upon to be okay so you should you should accept your your place in this group you should accept your place in the class but but should you always yeah so what seems to be lacking, uh, I think, in your presentation is some kind of argument about how to locate the notion of acceptance. And uh, if we sort of bring it into the therapeutic context, I think one place to begin is from the notion of loss or grief. And you touch upon this a little bit in the end of trauma. And uh, I would just like to bring up this model proposed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1969 on terminally ill patients. Uh, she shows that we go through five stages of grieving, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Okay, so it seems that this is where you should insert your notion. It's a final moment in the process of grieving of loss. Yeah, but should we always grieve and accept our conditions? This is the question, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, Torge, thank you so much. No, a, a fantastic point indeed. Um, I, I think perhaps Perhaps this is um, the limit, one, of the, one of the limitations of um, English and uh, with all respects to Julian American English that the, this word of acceptance does carry, can carry that, that value of I am accepting and I am happy about it versus if I understand correctly, I would, I would argue that your example is true in that when I get to that stage in loss and grief of acceptance, I may not still be happy about it. I may not wish this or want this. I recognize. So perhaps instead of acceptance, perhaps I can substitute recognize. And, and that gives me that ground to have that awareness and recognize where I'm at and, and then move forward. Perhaps, um, but no, I, I thank you for that and I, I will, I think that's a very good, um, not just question, but a good starting place for me to have as another point of understanding and triangulation. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Yes, and it's, I think, beyond Kubler-Ross, there's issues of people writing about continuing bonds. In other words, acceptance isn't an end point uh, as well with bereavement and in other issues. 
That's I find that interesting, but I'm cheating. I'm not asking a question. Uh, Susanna uh, Matham, Matam, uh, and then Ben Miusevich. I think uh, Susanna ha has your hand up. Would you like to ask? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you. Yes. Hi. Sorry, there's a bit of break up there. Hi. Yeah, it's it's Susanna, and I'm in Lincolnshire in uh, in England, also at BGU. So, hi, Julian and Hello. Uh, Richard. Hi. <laughs> um, um, I, I suppose the question I'm asking is about your choice of terminology because I think language is so important within this field um, and you refer to trauma as something that people experience. Now I, I, I want to know why, um, why you choose that term because in a way to me trauma or the layers of trauma are very much things that people can be subjected to. So in terms of silence we can silence children um, coercively uh, in, in all sorts of ways through bullying and, and, and corporations and all of these, you know, where children aren't allowed to speak. And so it's more about the layers of trauma where uh, there are global uh, um, traumatic events and there are individual and then you can be sub you can be subjected to both of them. Um, but and so mindfulness and um, DBT and so on uh, have got to consider those. I don't know whether that's something you do think about or whether I'm, I'm just asking a question based on them because as, um, as, a, as an adult who's also autistic and also an um, education professional, I see that um, there are sensory factors that affect autistic neurodivergent people in very, very different ways. So if you told me to be silent, my instinct would be, um, I can't be silent now. No, I don't want to be silent now. Now's not the time to be silent. You make me make more noise. So j just in terms of, so you're subjecting someone to uh, silence, but I actually love silence. I've taught myself uh, to be silent, but that's been a lifelong journey and not something that I was ever able to experience um, as a child. So just in terms of terminology, sorry, I made it a bit longer than perhaps I should have done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank, thank you, Susanna. Um, no, again, an excellent point. Um, um, you brought up so many excellent points that um, I would argue I, I may be qualified to have a discussion with you about, but of course, definitely not answer. I, I think to explain my use, perhaps, I, I, I for right or wrong, I, I think I have been referring experience as in the post afterwards effect. So that, as you mentioned, whatever that um, event, that stimuli, whatever those layers may be contributing towards the trauma, be they local, be they, I think of the systemic model, ecological systems and global community, whatever those layers are, when I'm referencing trauma, um, again, for right or wrong, I think I'm coming at it from a clinician view of viewing that, okay, I am recognizing this trauma manifest. I am seeing this in a maladaptive way. Um, and of course, you know, that's a whole separate discussion about, you know, am I looking at my client only through a deficits lens, which I don't believe is healthy versus a holistic lens. But that, I think that's how I might've been approaching it. Um, which again, to your point, yes, those words matter and those are important, um, not just in terms of my presentation, but as you mentioned, in my work with others. Thank you. I wasn't judging you. I just, yeah. <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> thank you for answering. Oh, we'll leave judgment for other higher people. Ben, talking of higher people, Ben, it's good to see you. You have your hand up patiently there. Yes. Do you like Thanks. to comment I, or ask? I enjoyed the talk very much. Uh, I just have uh, three things I'd like to say. The more uh, kind of a reaction to your talk, which was very <coughs> well done. Uh, you mentioned Erickson and uh, that got me thinking uh, for uh, more years than I was supposed to be. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago. And there was a very famous child psychologist, a psychoanalyst actually there, Bruno Bettelheim. And he wrote uh, some incredible books like Trones from Life, uh, Love is Not Enough. They were severely impaired uh, children. I, I would think if you looked at some of his research, he had the orthogenic school there at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> I think you might find certain cases of mutism and that sort of thing. 
but I think he's worth looking at. He's, as I say, a Freudian psychoanalyst. Um, as, uh, as a young man, I think he'd actually been in one of the concentration camps. Uh, and that sort of, but anyway, you might take a look at Bettelheim's work. <clears throat> one of the most impressive books on anger that I've ever read, and it's a child's anger, is The Painted Bird uh, by Jerzy Kaczynski, who was Polish, by the way. Uh, the story tells, as I recall, the novel has been many years. His parents are being transported with him through the uh, Polish uh, countryside or on a train, and uh, they throw him off the train to save him, uh, as I remember the story. Well, uh, he goes through all kinds of terrible and sadistic situations as he survives as a child. He's dark haired, so he's mistaken as uh, being Jewish. But uh, the painted bird describes uh, his growing anger. At a certain point, he becomes electively mute. And in the end, uh, he and a comrade, I think uh, they don't talk to each other. Uh, they're mute, uh, mutually mute, I guess. And they blow up a, a train. Uh, and then uh, he's reunited with his parents, but they've already had another child. And so the last scene is, if I remember rightly, he walks out into the snow and I think he expires, and that sort of thing. But anyway, it's a powerful, uh, probably the most significant uh, example of mutants that I can think of. And in children, um, you mentioned dialectical behaviorism. <clears throat> the master of uh, dialectic, of course, is uh, Hegel. And Hegel claims we can reduce the dynamics, the dialectical development of dynamics to being nothing and becoming. I wonder if you might think of doing something like that with uh, being being the silence, uh, the negation, uh, being the nothingness, and then the, uh, the uh, becoming, coming into expression from the silence. And that, that might be kind of a Hegelian twist on dialectical behaviorism. But, just thought of those uh, things, but I really enjoyed your talk very much for educating me. Well, and, and much thanks for now having giving me my reading list for the summer once uh, spring semester concludes. <laughs> <laughs> can I, uh, sorry, uh, that is, yeah, C can I follow up on what Ben's saying about dialectics? I've, I've tended to see dialectics as having I won't say neat, but having solutions. In other words, it's a stage, a synthesis, antithesis, uh, the uh, thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis. Uh, and that much of life, much of uh, conversation is dialogical, but not dialectical. It doesn't resolve. And it's back to that first question about is it, you know, do you accept? Is acceptance a passive thing? And one of my puzzles about mindfulness is it's present sense. It seems odd to combine a sense of the present with a sense of solution, which doesn't seem like a present thing, but also with the sense of ongoing dialogue more than a, a sort of resolving dialectic. I think that's that's a critical point. Uh, you can look at uh, dyadic um, discourse as twofold. But dialectic implies, at least for Hegel, uh, that it's triadic. Consciousness moves triadically from immediacy to mediacy, and then to the third that combines, unifies the first two conscious elements. We're talking about the activity of self-consciousness, how the infant who is not self-conscious becomes self-conscious. First, he distinguishes the self from objects, namely the mother's breast, and then he realizes the mother is a self-conscious being who has control over his happiness, his pleasure, and things like that. Once you use the word dialectic, for Marx, 
dialectic is twofold. It's capitalists against the proletariats. But for Hegel, it's triadic. Uh, Hegel probably has one of the most complicated uh, schemas of, you know, dialectic. I, I was in LCSW for years, not no longer practicing. And the, the clinics that I worked in, a number of them, uh, practice uh, uh, di dialectic, uh, cognitive dialectic. And I, you know, I, I wasn't, I thought it was just two-sided. There was the patient and there was the therapist. Dialectic for Hegel is, it, it, it incorporates all three of the, the activities, sorry. Richard, how are you feeling dialogically? <laughs> no, no, thank you. This is wonderful. I, um, I, I, what it makes me consider is within mindfulness practice um, that that present moment awareness or um, in play therapy, I will often use the term attending that even though I am not accepting, I am not valuing, I am attending, noticing perhaps. And it, whatever word choice, it makes me consider the the perspective that yes, it is the present moment. But um, then, to your point, maybe that I am not present moment stationary. That I am present moment in motion, and that I am I am not at this dialectic or this. But perhaps that this is my awareness and acceptance, knowing that for right now. And at least for me, that then in, therapeutically brings in the conversation of the element of hope that, OK, well, if I'm here right now, then, yes, I know I can go back there, but perhaps I can go there. And so that I don't know if that's that when you were listening, when I was listening to you, that would make me think about as not being a stationary place, but rather being um, a continual um, active dynamic. Uh, yeah, I think motion. what's powerful about what you're uh, saying you're, you're, you're connecting a consciousness, self-consciousness especially, with expression. Uh, the, when you come out of the silence, uh, there's a, a expression. That's when you express with others and to others and that sort of thing. That's the dynamic that I think you can exploit as dialectical rather than dyadic. Triadic and dialectical, but anyway, just the thought. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we do we have questions? We have so, uh, so many people from uh, um, all around the world. It's lovely to see uh, see you all there. Do we have? Ah, we have um, a question from Piotr Domaracci uh, from Poland. So we are spreading the countries out as well. Welcome, Piotr. Yeah, Thank you, Julian. I would like to welcome everyone uh, once again, especially our organizers, Julian and Mogosha, uh, the speaker Richard, and especially Ben Miuskovic. Thank you for this interesting lecture. Uh, it was a great pleasure to listen to it. The topic intrigued me a double. Firstly, because I'm interested in the issue of silence as a correlate of solitude, and secondly, because I associate nothing less with silence than children. I have three of them myself, and I'm also a school teacher, so I really know what I'm talking about. We live in a culture of constant noise and even shouting. And everyone wants to talk, few can listen. It's important to keep producing sounds, to keep sharing out words. Uh, children and young people, whether they like or not, soak up this atmosphere. Researchers, including, for example, Jonathan Zimmerman, uh, speak of an always on generation. Children and young people uh, who are addicted to instant communication with others smartphones, iPhones, social media, constant movement, constant circulation of information, in the media, numerous entertainment programs, everywhere singing, everyone is dancing, 
constantly and endlessly something is happening and must be happening, changing, rushing. How to find a place for silence in all this? How to convince people of its beneficial influence, especially children and young people who, because of their age, tend to shy away from silence. They associate silence with uh, uh, inactivity and boredom. It's uncomfortable. They don't like it. Just like the silence that uh, suddenly falls during its social uh, meeting. Silence is perceived as something awkward, embarrassing. How could you explain this uh, interesting uh, matter? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, everything from myself, Richard. Oh, well, okay. So, Piotra, I, I, I've seen you at symposium and conferences before and, and your discussion on the last seminar. So I was buckling up because I knew, okay, here it comes. He, he's got something good. And you asked how I can explain, and I won't. I, I can't. I will leave that to you as you so eloquently already did. I love what you shared, and I am in full agreement. And I, what stands out the most to me from what you just shared is if if indeed I am I am expanding my definition of noise, uh, not just um, audible noise, but as you mentioned, smartphones, tablets, texting, TikTok, you know, if I am expanding my definition of noise, perhaps hopefully I uh, subsequently will expand my definition of silence, of healthy silence, that silence is, yes, in the wood um, quietly. And you mentioned solitude by mm -hmm. myself. Silence um, is also uh, turning turning off the cell phone and putting it away in the drawer yeah. for the weekend. Um, right. and, and so that's exciting to me. Uh, and, and again, um, as someone who only has two kids, that, that's plenty for me. But as someone uh, with my own children and being in the school setting, I agree with you. I, I, am, I am saddened and concerned. How can I as parent, how can I as educator, um, as you mentioned, how can I introduce this radical idea that silence and solitude may not always be awkward, harmful, detrimental? that they can actually be, um, they can renew, that they can be healthy and that they can be um, um, substantive in, in their experience. So thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you kindly for your reply. And Richard will silently telephone Piotr's children uh, <laughs> to teach them, uh, I'm sure. The, uh, we have uh, questions up from uh, uh, Gosha uh, Vueco and Noel Keating. So, Gosha first, perhaps. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Richard, I'd like to thank you for the fantastic speech. I really loved that. Uh, while listening to you, I was thinking about a proverb that we have uh, in Polish language and in Polish culture, which is very harmful um, and I think very damaging, but unfortunately repeating in many, repeated in many uh, Polish families still. <laughs> and it is um, children and fish have no voice at all. You know, it is something <laughs> absolutely horrible uh, to me and I think to all of us. And I was thinking that probably in Poland and in Polish pedagogy, we must still, we are on that stage that we probably must still encourage children to speak, you know? So maybe that's not the stage to think about mindfulness techniques and probably maybe that's one of the reasons that it's not very popular in Poland still. But my question is, or my, rather my request to you is, I would like to listen some more about an impact of mindfulness techniques and um, contemplative techniques toward uh, children's relationships with others. Because of course we know much about its impact on uh, our well-being, uh, self-awareness and so on. But of course we can guess that it probably makes children better listeners, for example, but 
I would like to hear some more from you and from your point of view. And, and, and forgive me, Gosha, say, say again regarding mindfulness with children and. Uh, no, just only um, how mindfulness it can influence children's relationships with other and how we treat other people. That we, if you practice this technique and uh, we spend some time for meditation and so on, uh, how can it change us so that we uh, are, for example, better people? You know. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, in in mindfulness, um, mindfulness practices, mindfulness meditations. Um, as I mentioned, it is it is very common to start um, in the same way that I might use a behavioral intervention. It is very common to start with focusing attention and awareness um, on the physical sensation of the breath, breathing, on the sensations um, of heat, uh, moisture, noise, and and again, I would say as. Um, I think Susanna mentioned that this is acceptance in terms of attending rather than I approve of this. And once, and that is really used because that is so often most easily engaged. Clients, children, well, even adults, can most easily engage with attending, with bringing their awareness to the sensations. From there, uh, whether it's one day or usually over multiple practices, then awareness is brought to um, the thoughts that are coming through the noise. If if we you know if we expanded Piotr's um, definition of noise of not just external tablets and devices, but also the internal noise that I'm experiencing, mindfulness moves from physical to the mental thoughts that I'm having, and then we move to emotional awareness and attending to the emotions that I'm feeling. Once all of that is done, or rather not done, forgive me, once that is um, being practiced, then multiple mindfulness, I would also for a later day point out many contemplative, reflective practices, many faith practices, then it is moved towards awareness of others. Um, a common mindfulness meditation is a loving kindness or a compassion meditation for others. And, and I believe when if you look over the literature, if you look over the practices that are outlined, it is structured that way because I cannot, I am not in a healthy, um, strong position to extend that awareness to others and that compassion to others if I have not practiced it for myself. If um, this may be simplistic, so forgive me, but I cannot extend love. I cannot extend that warmth to others if I am not extending it to myself. At the very least, it may be shallow because it has not taken root within me. And so when many of the, in some of those resources on the slide I showed, many of the mindfulness in school curriculum interventions specifically focus on that scaffolded approach. They specifically focus on, let us begin, especially when we consider the developmental level of children and where they are, let us focus on the awareness of the physical sens sensations. We can then move to their mental, their thoughts. We can move to emotions, then towards, you know, now we're at that place of considering awareness of others, compassion towards others, and I don't have it um, at hand right now, and I don't know of particular quantitative investigations to look at, you know, what type of a, uh, of a difference, if any, are we seeing in, for example, behavior referrals uh, with children, like their behavioral choices. But the premise is that move towards it. Uh, last thing, and then, then I will turn it back over to you, Gosha, Gosha is that um, as someone who has been in that school setting and specifically for such a time working with children that were exhibiting emotional behavior disorders. Um, I firmly believe in those guardrails, whether they're you know dialectics or boundaries, whatever, that there is a need um, for having you know some side of some sort of guidelines. Um, my fear is that if I only adhere to those rigid guidelines and I never invite these expressions of silence, these these opportunities for silence, for solitude, for mindfulness. Um, I, that's not contributing towards children's wellness. I want to be careful, though, because if I suddenly I'm 
I'm having no, my structure is so innovative and it's so detached from the reality of school, from the reality of my children's lives. I believe that's just as much a disservice because any gains I may be making in their awareness, their compassion, their mindfulness, how will they be able to integrate it into their lived experience? If, you know, when they go into the classroom, when they leave the classroom and go into the world. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, thank you. Incidentally, my own research suggests that, or my own feeling is that just as children are uh, misbehave in school, are naughty in school, they also do not want to be in a school where people are allowed to be naughty. I think the same for silence and noise. They may be noisy in school, but they do not want to be in a school that is noisy. Uh, and when you ask them, they often say, no, we like it when it's quiet. Not scary quiet, but working quiet. So it's a paradox, I think, of children and perhaps adults too, but particularly children, that just because they're noisy doesn't mean they enjoy noisiness. Uh, I think they'll enjoy both. We have uh, Noel uh, Keating and Liam Dempsey. Noel, would you? Uh, where are you? Hi there. Uh, hi. hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah. OK, um, just uh, I, I'm, it's interesting. Just what you said uh, <laughs> brings me nicely into what I wanted to say, because I was struck by what what uh, Peter said uh, around children avoiding silence. Of course, I don't think that's a conscious decision. I think it's a cultural habit. Uh, they avoid silence because they have so much technology and there is that um, implication in the culture that they must constantly be in touch with other people and constantly in contact. My experience is that children love silence. My own doctoral research uh, three years ago uh, was on uh, meditation and the, the deeper fruits of meditation for children. Uh, in particular, I, I was interested in exploring what you would call the spiritual fruits of meditation. And I found that children were able to give very rich metaphorical description, although they lacked theological and spiritual language. They were able to give very deep um, metaphorical description to their own experience of meditation. Um, and they found it enormously helpful at a very, very deep level of, of their being. Um, and, and I was interested then that, um, I mean, I joined this, I only heard about it yesterday. I had never come across the ISRS before and I'm interested to explore more and find out more. Um, but I was interested that Richard uh, never mentioned um, any of the, the faith traditions. His talk, I know his talk was on mindf mindfulness, but I wonder whether he has uh, explored um, silence in children uh, through many of the faith traditions because I think children, they love to meditate and they find very, very deep spiritual fruits from it. And I wonder whether he has ever considered that or why he has limited himself uh, to reflecting on mindfulness and silence. No, thank you, Noel. No, I, um, capital point, um, um, I, I limited myself because um, I, I, I figured for Julian and Gasha, I should not take up um, a full day <laughs> seminar, perhaps, but 40 minutes. Um, and, uh, your, your point is is spot on. Um, I, I must unfortunately admit I have not um, written or researched um, past own interest um, as, as you're, you're mentioning. And so it's very exciting for me to hear that you are doing this is your your focus. Um, I think of um, multiple um, readings about parallels between mindfulness and centering prayer mindfulness and, and as you're mentioning contemplation contemplative practices um i i even just think of my own personal readings with um uh, campuses the imitation of christ and how um his discussion of the interior and exterior self and just i just believe so many parallels with mindfulness um no i i, I think it's it's rich um, to explore, for me, what I took away from you right now is um, how am I, how are we <coughs> providing the opportunities for children to, to even know, as you're mentioning, silence, meditation, prayer, whatever maybe is an option. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, in the other parts of the world, right now there is, a, I'm hoping it grows, there is a, a fad, a trend among teenagers they will call it a turn off weekend or a cell phone silent weekend 
where they will go for a party to a day or go camp out for a weekend and one person has a basket or something, all cell phones are turned off and put in the basket for the entire time. And it's kind of a novel experience right now, um, almost considered countercultural, sadly, in my word choice, sadly, because of all that we've talked about of this noise and this interconnectedness. And, and I think about that, and I'm excited about that, and then I'm also personally convicted. What, what am I doing, yes, in my research, but also in my work with, with children, with clients, to, as I mentioned earlier, to bring about this awareness that this is an option. You, you can find, again, depending on their experience, their developmental level, that may, may never even come across their, uh, their awareness because of what they see and hear and is modeled consistently for them. Can I, can I just say like that what I have been doing since I did my research is I now promote the practice of whole school meditation in primary schools here in Ireland. Uh, and over the last eight years, we have introduced meditation to about 50,000 children. Um, and they, they absolutely love it. And it's a whole school practice. So at least two or three times a week, the whole school falls silent and every child in every class has the opportunity to meditate in silence. So they become used to that as something that is just a normal part of life and that has great benefits for them. I, I, I'm then particularly interested in the deeper spiritual fruits of that, but but I do teach it as a universal practice, one that that has practical benefits uh, as as my, as mindfulness teaches, but also very deep fruits. Mm. Well, thank you. As as mindfulness has as well as as uh, yes. Richard was saying, so that's fascinating. Good to hear of your research, Noel. And I think we have with all these questions and issues, there are so many. Uh, conversations that uh, we want to come out uh, from this. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. We have Liam uh, Dempsey and then Adrian, who uh, I don't have a last name, but Liam, would you like to say hello and uh, a comment or a question? Yes, thanks Julian and, and thanks Richard for um, for your talk and for, for everyone else who asked the question as well. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a bit, I work with um, really in, in the curriculum side of things here in Belfast in the, in the north of Ireland. And I was wondering if you could say a bit about the place of mindfulness um, in your curriculum. Is, is it something which is a prescribed part of the curriculum uh, and the different vehicles that might be used for, uh, for children to explore mindfulness? Uh, thank you, Liam. Um, so uh, first of all, in full disclosure, you know, right now I am not in the school setting. I'm teaching at the university level. And um, so I have embedded that the practice into some of my classes um, and um, and, and I, I'm, I'll attempt to relate that uh, for my graduate students. They are meeting. We have class in the evenings. And so in the same way, I focused on transition times with my students in the school. I'm focusing on that with my graduate students as they are hustling and bustling from their daytime job, commuting to the university, and then I'm expecting them to sit down and we're going to get right to, so I mean, you know, right to work. And so I'm using mindfulness practices, first of all, as just uh, a means to calm, to become aware of where they are and center themselves before we go about the, the aspects of learning. In the school setting, um, there are, mul again, multiple curriculum. And so on the US side of things, as I mentioned, because of our Judeo-Christian heritage, I, I think, and, and an over rely or an over adherence to the separation of church and state, there is there is still a lot of caution about if you how you go about utilizing a, a mindfulness curriculum. And so some schools do adopt them whole. Oftentimes you will see it as a component brought in by the school social worker, brought in as a weekly lesson by the school counselor or the school psychologist. I think one of the, the biggest step forwards that I have seen is that idea that Langer um, has written about in terms of novelty production. One of her books actually is Mindful Learning, that um, perhaps it's a deal with the devil, but they're able to make a correlation, if you will forgive me, a correlation. Well, see, this is one more educational um, initiative that we're doing. And, you know, we're, we're going to quietly whisper that we're really doing it for the whole and well, wholeness and wellness of children. Uh, and so that's been one more point of connection for embedding it with the curriculum in terms of um, what I'm what I'm seeing, and what's out there. Uh, similar to what Noel said, oftentimes it will begin with um, just the practices of a, a mindful meditation for the whole classroom 
for the whole school. Additionally, um, you know, there's I think some of the practices I talked about, um, you know, whether it's um, a mindfulness meditation or a mindful walk. Again, these different practices that are focused on uh, bringing about awareness. Uh, I think especially with children in the school setting, never being a haha got you or never being manipulative, but um, having I think of an activity based I've sometimes taken whether it's an apricot or something, um, some piece of fruit that has m texture to it, has feel and and Reasons. Leading, yeah, mindful eating. And, and again, I always want to be careful because it can be a slippery slope into what Cabot Zinn called that McMindfulness. But using that to challenge their perceptions that you eat it as fast as you can, getting, you know, getting back to this, this acculturation that let's go, 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 noise, 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 and having them focus. Okay, don't, don't chew it yet. What do you notice about the texture of the apricot? Right? Anything activity that's so, in my opinion, in my observation, so many educators are already so good at of bringing about awareness, making it interesting and fun. It's just now my goal is towards that awareness and that acceptance. Again, all of our discussion about acceptance as attending or noticing rather than I love this. But so awareness and acceptance. Is that helpful? Yeah, it, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll say I am cheating, aren't I? Because I'm hosting this. Uh, but I've uh, looked at the possible um, solitude practices within many school subjects because science has a history of lone scientist concentration. Music has a history of musical rehearsal as a solitude practice. Uh, sport has getting in the zone, uh, focusing all of these things. So there are different solitude practices. Goodness sake, even uh, reading. Uh, I think schools have stopped having time where children just read. They have to read and analyze, read and analyze rather than read for any time. Or as Rachel Kessler says, uh, uh, we stop children daydreaming when daydreaming may be the most important thing they do whilst they're at school. I think uh, if we can sneak in one more question, Adrian, uh, you've had your hand up for a while. If you have a fairly short question. Right. Apologies. <laughs> no problem. Uh, can you see me? I think I so. Can, yes. Yes. Can. Okay. Good. Um, uh, actually, a comment, and maybe even I, I want to listen to your comment. Um, Piotr said that it's difficult for children to get into um, silence. Well, um, I confirm what Noel has shared, and we've conducted a um, a uh, an experiment, actually an action research with three year old children in kindergarten and uh, little by little over a 16 week period um, uh, they've been able to do silence to uh, so it's more of an issue of acculturate um, getting them accustomed um, into mindfulness from a very young age montessori had already has the silence game um, with children. So it was already noted that 100 years ago, children love silence. So um, yeah, what's your take on this? Thank you, Adrian. No, well, well stated. Um, perhaps, perhaps it's less that we um, are discovering a new direction for wellness and instead uh, recognizing how much we have left behind and how much we have um, disregarded along the way. I, I think of Julian just prior to this mentioning the the lack of quiet reading time. I, I think um, I would I would hope I'm not that old, but I, I think back to when I was in primary school and we had times where all of us were expected to find a book and to sit quietly at our desk and read. And in that regard, all of us communally experiencing silence. Um, I, I think of times growing up where it was a quiet time. And, and, and so to your point, as we have perhaps lost all of these opportunities to, I, I guess I'll say train, to prepare, to show, to teach, to model the children the different ways silence can be experienced directly or maybe indirectly for the, the reading example, as these have gone away, it is now unfortunately so much of a new novel idea, yet perhaps engaging in research such as yours, we can become surprised at look how quickly they pick it up. And it's it's really a conviction perhaps of ourselves rather than 
something to rejoice about for the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Wow, there are so there are so we have so many pieces of research we're all going to be going away and doing now. That's wonderful. Our our next, interestingly, our next seminar in July twenty uh, second is Amanda Fulford from Edge Hill University, who's a specialist on uh, uh, Thoreau and uh, 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 nature and the relationship of solitude in nature and the value of that, which is a, uh, I think will complement wonderfully what Malka talked about in the previous one and what Richard you've been talking about today. And I'm told by those with more technical knowledge than I have that uh, we may be able to live stream that on something, um, which is uh, I'm sure is good for those who are always on. It's been wonderful to see so many people and new people as well, including people at my own institution who I haven't met yet. So that's that's great. Good to see you there and people from all around the world. Uh, and most of all, to hear you, Richard, both talk yourself about your subject and engage so engagingly and dialogically with those uh, questions and uh, comments. So. Richard, can I thank you so much? We will be uh, finishing uh, finishing now uh, for the time being, and we will be continuing, as you said, through the uh, ISRS, International uh, Society for Research on Solitude, and through all our friendships and connections and whatever um, with these discussions. Please, if those who are who have uh, taken part are happy being emailed with the information about the next one. That will be good. Please do join us in the organisation if you'd like to. Uh, but can I, on behalf of all of us, and I don't know if you actually, is there a, I can't see a clapping emoji, but I would like to clap. And if there is a clapping emoji somewhere, I don't know how these things work, uh, then I would definitely add one. Oh, there is. Hey. Well, actually, we could actually clap. Thank you so much, Richard. It's been wonderful to be with you, uh, be with you, be with you all and with you, Richard. So thank you so much. Cheerio. Good thank luck. you.